Good afternoon, and thank you to everyone who has joined us at Texas Christian University. Today, we welcome a panel of DFW real estate innovators. The Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex has added more than 1.2 million residents over the last decade, and we'll discuss what pressure that spike puts on housing and older areas of town, and how you as residents will feel that growth. I'm Tracy Renee Williams, president of the TCU National Alumni Board, and I'd like to start by introducing our panelists. First, we have Terrence Maiden. Terrence is the CEO of Russell Glenn, a real estate company in Dallas. He graduated from TCU in 2000 with a, ba with a Bachelor of Science in Psychology. He was a linebacker for Horned Frog Football, 1998 through, through 2000, and he's a member of the Block T Association. Terrence is currently working to redesign the Redbird Mall in the Oak Cliff neighborhood in Dallas. Thanks for joining us, Terrence. Thank you. We also have Susan Miller Grippy. Susan is a co-founder and co-president of M2G Ventures, real estate investment and development team in Fort Worth. She graduated from TCU with, with a Bachelor of Business Administration in Finance and Real Estate in 2008. She has been the Vice President of Finance for the Trademark Property Company before starting M2B, M2G Ventures with her twin sister in 2014. Thanks so much for joining us, Susan. Lastly, we have, Leslie, we have Leslie Purvis. Leslie is the Associate Director of TCU Center for Real Estate. She is a two-time graduate of TCU. She holds a Bachelor of General Studies, Class of 1997, and an MBA class of 2015. Leslie is a third generation real estate professional and she's taught Purvis Real Estate Training Institute classes. She is also a professor of real estate and finance in TCU's Neely School of Business. Thanks so much for joining us today, Leslie. Thanks, Tracy. Well, again, welcome everyone and welcome to everyone watching online. I'd like to remind everyone who's watching, if you have questions as we go, please drop them in the chat and we'll try to answer them live. The Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex population has grown 20% since 2010, according to US Census data. With this increased population comes a greater need for housing and amenities. We're going to talk about what this means for the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Now, Terrence and Susan are both working to revitalize already developed areas. So Susan, I'd like to start with you. One of M2G's projects was serving as retail partner in the redevelopment of Mule Alley and the historic Fort Worth Stockyards. What is the vision for M2G? Um, well, I'd say, you know, for M2G as a company, um, you know, separate from, um, uh, 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 the stockyards, and we'll talk about that. Um, you know, MTG strives to be, you know, just the chosen innovative platform for um, unique mixed use and industrial projects throughout the U.S. And, um, we got involved with the stockyards back in 2018 um, and um, just finished our project, Mule Alley, um, down in the Forest Stockyards. So the stockyards is a is over a 70 acre historic district um, uh, inside um, um, inside Fort Worth. And it's really the cowboy capital of the world. And um, Mule Alley is a project within that that is a 150,000 square feet adaptive reuse of two 75,000 square foot old horse and mule barns that literally up until 2016, actual horses and mules were, were inside the barns. Um, it is flanked by a uh, Marriott Autograph Collection Hotel um, if anyone's been down there, um, it's called the Hotel Drover, and it is absolutely amazing. You know, when we first got involved with the project, two things we really wanted to do. Um, one was um, the, the stockyards from a local perspective. I don't know if y'all remember this. Locals didn't go down there. Um, it was really a place for tourists. And so Mule Alley was specifically built um, in order for us locals to want to go there. And same thing with Hotel Drover. Hotel Drover... Um, is one of, um, you know, one of the hotels that we hope um, people want to do staycations there, you know, that type of stuff. Um, and then the other piece of it was um, really bringing unique retail and entertainment that was thematic to the stockyards without it being cheesy. 
Um, and so if you've been down there, it's, it, it, there's something for everyone, number one. So there's literally like the pop gun c- candy barrel all the way up to high-end Lucchese boots. And then you have that same dynamic on your dining experience. Um, so you really can go and, you know, a three-year-old and an 80-year-old can have a great time, um, locals and tourists. And it be something that, you know, I, you know I'm, I think we're super fortunate to have that in Fort Worth. I mean, it's literally a place um, where people come from all over the world, definitely the state, not obviously regionally. And now it's a place where us locals can also frequent, which is just, it, that, that's been a big shift over the last couple of years. That's so interesting you say that in terms of the development being designed really to revitalize the area for locals to enjoy. Um, Susan, Terrence, and Leslie, what are your thoughts on that in terms of redevelopment in general um, and what you're seeing in terms of the developing areas for local residents to enjoy and not just be something that is um, for tourists or vacationers to enjoy. How important is that for um, for areas like Fort Worth and Dallas and beyond? You want to go first, Leslie? Sure. So what I can say to Susan is their ideas worked because a week doesn't go by that I hear from someone, whether it's a family member or it's a friend or a friend of a friend, that they're going and spending a night or two or three at the drove. And then other friends, I, I'm still kind of pandemic and not going out much, but I hear about people going to the restaurants and the bars and the activities. So it's really neat that it's, it makes that facility and that whole area be used 365 days a year regardless of whether tourists are in town or not. So bravo, Susan, and your team. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, and, and that type of, um, you know, we're, we're known for, Jessica and I, um, we don't shy away from any type of, any type of challenge, um, but it, it took a lot of very targeted conversations with the right, you know, um, um, leaders at those retailers or restaurants to really, um, give it the life and the um, and the layering. If you've been there, just the, the mini layering, the mini decisions, the detailed decisions, even down to the build out. I mean, if you've been down there, I mean, those are literally um, over hundred year old barns and they're historic structures. Um, so you know, we just even to get the design and build out in a way that we we wanted people to feel like that this is the even if it was a Lucchese, it was the only Lucchese in the world. You know, so it just um, it's it's been a really fun project. Thank you. That's awesome. So if anyone watching has not been down there, we will encourage them to um, to take a look and really see how the area has just been um, revitalized. So thank you so much for sharing. That uh, Terrence, I'd like to go to you and just love for you to tell our audience what led you to start Russell Glenn, especially after such a long career still in real estate, but in other in other aspects of real estate. Yeah, first of all, thank you, Tracy. Uh, I actually launched Russell Glenn about 18 months ago, so uh, didn't realize we'll be going through a pandemic uh, mm-hmm. and uh, all sorts of uh, different trying times for our nation as we uh, began to grapple through race relations with the George Floyd uh, murder. So uh, the timing was was interesting. I've been in development for uh, 21 years and uh, was able to garner a lot of experience. And the rationale for launching Russell Glenn was based on uh, an investment thesis that you can go into traditionally underinvested, underserved communities and bring quality development projects to those areas. And uh, we began uh, about four years ago uh, working on the former Redbird Mall, uh, which has uh, been an incredible example of how you can go and do social impact and also get a, a, a good return. Uh, on your investment. And so we're going to carry that uh, further. We have a couple other malls that we are uh, actively uh, in the early stages of of developing. And 
you know, we're excited about it. Our, our hope is to create over 10,000 jobs in these communities to invest over a billion dollars in these communities. So we have a, a really robust goal uh, over the next five years, but we're excited about the future of the con uh, company. Thanks so much for sharing that, Terrence, because what you're what you're showing with the Redbird development or redevelopment is that it's more than just about the redevelopment itself. It's about the impact that that redevelopment has on the communities in which um, in which it's taking taking place. So I know that it hasn't been that long, but what would you say? Um, are, are you proving your investment theory right <laughs> with this? Um, with the redevelopment of Redbird, and what do you, what would you hope to see in the other communities that you that you'll be venturing into that might even surpass what's happening with the with the Redbird, Redbird redevelopment? Yeah. So for those who don't know, uh, Redbird uh, is a mall that's the only mall in Southern Dallas. Uh, it was built in the mid '70s. Uh, so it's your traditional. Uh, mall that the community would go to. Uh, the community of Oak Cliff in that area is predominantly African-American. Uh, and the community started to decline in the, the late 80s, early 90s. There were some crime issues in the community. And a couple of the major retail tenants uh, opted to relocate further south. Uh, and so the mall, although it was vacant, uh, predominantly vacant, it was still cash flowing. Uh, and the community was still excited about the mall being there. So uh, when I got involved with uh, Peter Brodsky, our vision was to convert this mid-70s era mall to an urban mixed-use uh, development. And so we've been successful at that. Uh, one of the things that we realized very early that there was a void for quality health care. So we were uh, successful at landing UT Southwestern and Children's to open a regional medical center and then Parkland is also open in a regional medical center. Uh, we have a, a big company out of Atlanta uh, called Chime that's going to open up an 80,000 square foot office and employ over 2,000 people from that community. Uh, we're having a lot of good conversations with various restaurants now. Uh, we have urban multifamily that's coming in, 300 units that are 100% occupied. So the, the project is really trending in the right way. And we like this model of looking at malls because retail in general has been struggling. And if we think if we can identify some of these class B, class C malls that are located in communities, particularly underserved communities, we could go in and create value, uh, whether it's housing, grocery store, healthcare, uh, or other amenities that we can bring and fulfill for that community. Thanks for sharing that. And you all who are watching, we just put the link to more about this story and the redevelopment of Redbird. Um, so for more information, please go to magazine.tcu.edu for the summer edition, where uh, there is an in-depth story covering the redevelopment of the Redbird Mall and what this means for the, um, for the community of, uh, of South Dallas. I, I know we're going to come back to some questions around what the, what that trend and others um, might be and the impact that those have on the surrounding communities. But Leslie, I'd like to ask you, um, as you're as we're hearing from Susan and Terrence in the in the work that they're doing, they're really working to breathe new life into areas of Fort Worth and Dallas. What do you believe other real estate entrepreneurs can learn from them? Well, the the common theme that I see with both of them is they're hard workers. And both have a lot of perseverance, which you really have to. Uh, the project that Susan's working on with her sister in the stockyards and Redbird with, with Terrence and Dallas, I mean, those are projects that take many, many years. And, I, you know, I saw where somebody was asking when was Redbird going to be completed. Terrence, what is the timeline on that? Yeah, so uh, Leslie, to your point, we started five years ago. Uh, we will be completed probably within the next 18 months, though. So in, in total, it's probably a six-year project. So it, you, you have to have a lot of patience. What I think consumers see is we see projects where it looks like, you know, things might take two or three years. But in actuality, some of them are, are going to take eight to ten years. Some take even longer than that. I mean, Susan, think about the Hillwood, uh, the Alliance Project in North Fort Worth. I mean, yes. 25 years. 
Mm -hmm. And the Dickies Arena that's right across the street from my real estate school. They started working on that in 1994 and it opened two years ago. So the hard work and perseverance, you have to have it because to get these big deals done, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of patience too. Thanks so much for bringing that up, Leslie, because I think a lot of times and not just within real estate development, but in so many other um, areas as well, we people look at what the outcome is going to be, but they don't really see all of the work that is happening year, year over year over year. So thank you so much for um, for bringing, bringing that up. And not only because of everyone who might be involved involved but this idea of wanting to ensure that we want to get it right for the communities and so there's a lot of work that has to go into ensuring that you're getting you're you're getting the right development right for the community and its members so susan and terrence thank you so much for the work that you're doing to ensure that happens we go ahead yes i want to add one other thing they can both they have a vision and not everybody in the real estate business is able to have a vision and develop it, develop it and to see it through to completion. And it's like, I wish I had that kind of brain because so few people do. Mm -hmm. Susan, I would never in my life have, I mean, I've been going over to the stockyards, you know, since I was a little girl and I would never have dreamed what y'all have done with it. And everything that you've done has been a positive. You know, it's 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 been incredible. So so to be able to take their ideas and their visions and to put it into, you know, a, a project or a product that we can all be proud of is, you know, I think it's kudos to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Leslie. So that brings up another question. Speaking of vision, um, Terrence and Susan and Leslie, what happens when you have this vision that others may not agree with? what does it take for you to really stick to the vision that you have as developers and knowing the right what you believe is the right thing to do for the community that you're that you're developing um i'll go first um interestingly enough uh for us even though yes we've got a, a high vision we typically are developing in a way that we think we're meeting like the community where it is so I have yet in our career said, okay, I'm going to develop this and the city, the community's like, I don't want that. And I'm like, here's my vision and here's why I'm right. Mm -hmm. Um, so what we may be doing though, is taking, so, so for example, the stockyards, we've got an area of town called the foundry in Fort Worth. Um, uh, or, um, like where I am right now, I'm in a, I'm in a, um, it's an old school that was converted to um, a, an office building in Dallas. Um, we may have people that really say, I don't, I don't see that. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't see that being possible. And that's more where you've got to say like, you know, this is what we see. And then over time, as you do it, you prove it. And then, you know, over time that ends up changing and then people start to trust you. It takes about, you know, the, you know, multiple projects before they're like, okay, it actually is going to turn out, you know, how, you know, how they're saying it's going to, and can they really do that? Um, but from just, you know, a use standpoint or like what we're, what we're, what we try to re reimagine things to be, I, we've never been in a spot where I've, I've tried to prove, you know, prove against what the community wanted. Um, and generally in our stuff, we're taking underutilized assets mm -hmm. and, and, and bringing them back to life. So it's a, it's a welcome for the community. Yeah, uh, I'll just add that, you know, as a developer, I feel like I'm in the people business. And so I don't ever go into a community assuming what is best for them. Um, and that, that's a critical step right in the process. Uh, so we have a number of different community meetings we want the community to have a, a voice and a say so in what we're providing there. Uh, and then we also meet with uh, city leadership. Uh, we want to make sure that there is a common thread uh, throughout and that everyone has a voice at the table. And uh, the biggest thing that we we discovered that if you can fulfill those needs and provide quality amenities to these communities, they will embrace it. 
right? Uh, we are extremely strategic about our, uh, our plans when we go in because um, if you don't have community support and buy-in, it's oftentimes you're fighting an uphill battle uh, to, to get anything to move forward. And so, you know, that's, that's been our approach. It's just beginning with the community and the people first. Thanks so much. You both have spoken to the importance and how critical it is to have shared vision and how important it is to collaborate with the community um, as you as you go about uh, through with development and redevelopment. So thank you all for um, emphasizing how important that is. Uh, we do have a couple of questions from our audience that I'd like to take. And Leslie, I'd like to start with you with this one. How has the Deanna Kelly Hill has asked, how has the pandemic impacted real estate and more, more especially with more people who are working remotely now? Um, what does that look like right now? I saw that. I saw that question a few minutes ago. So mm -hmm. it's been really interesting for me to you know, we've got a whole network or I have a whole network of people that are in the real estate business that I talk to about what's going on in the market. And it was really interesting to see after, let's say, if the pandemic roughly we closed campus in March. And so around June, I started talking to people who said, you know, we're starting to do deals and and I would see it on my own. I'd be driving around in the car. Sometimes I'd be with my mom and she'd say, I can't believe they're building an office building or they're building a restaurant right now. And initially I couldn't either because you're thinking, okay, all these people are going to be working from home and why do you need new offices? And what's happened is after we kind of stabilized towards the beginning of the pandemic, then you know, the construction just accelerated. It's like, we still need office space. And what's, what's happening is the companies, not only do they still need the space they have, they need more space. And so they're doing alternating schedules where you have people who come in and work MWF or they'll do Tuesday, Thursday, or however they work it out. And they need even more space to be able to do that. And you see how the restaurants, I mean, I don't know how many new restaurants I've seen in the last 18 months. And they've gotten really good at curbside delivery and they've gotten really good at takeout and um you know and and on the question on the pandemic also it certainly has slowed it it slowed down the building and housing whether it was single family or multifamily, because we had lumber shortages and we had escalating prices and construction materials and you know we had supply chain problems and that are still being worked out but we can't build it fast enough and so it's it's almost like the pandemic caused just that initial little blip in the first two or three months. And then we're back where we were prior to that time period. Thank goodness. What do y'all think, Susan? I mean, um, you, were, you were doing the boat art. Yeah, I agree with everything you said, but you know, I've also seen I've also seen a lot of the opposite too. I mean, and truly, everything you said, you know, we're seeing, um, but we are still seeing in some of our own assets. It's kind of a have or a have have not. You know, some assets are doing really really well. Some markets are doing really really well, and some are still struggling. Um, so, for example, uh, Fort Worth office. Um, we've got a different psychographic demographic of of people. So, Fort Worth office for us, we didn't see occupancy decline or new lease new leases not being signed. Dallas um, took a much more conservative approach. You've got more companies there that have, you know, multiple locations throughout the US. So they're so the CEOs are making decisions for, you know, their New York office or Dallas office and their LA office. So Dallas office is closed. So we've seen um, a Dallas office um, still um, um, still struggling. Um, I can't remember the, the stat, but just sublease availability in Dallas, urban Dallas is pretty, is pretty high. Um, and so we have that um, from just a, you know, um, a, a, a true retail perspective, because we've got, um, we're, we're seeing a lot of spending right now. So retail is doing really, really well, but I still do have when I'm talking to our entrepreneurs that really stuck it out um, in the pandemic, they're still, they're still a little, um, they're still, you know, their war chests were emptied. 
So, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, the idea of expanding again um, for some of those entrepreneurs is still, they're still, um, it's not, they're not there yet. They're getting there though. And, and, and things are back. So it, um, it's, it's still interesting for us. It's, it's have or have not in certain um, cases. Um, and uh, uh, it just, it just shows how complex our world is today. I mean, we're just, we're just so much more of a complex world and it's going to continue to be even more so. Um, and we're just, we're, we're faced with a lot of, a lot of different dynamics, a lot of diff- competing priorities. And we've got, um, uh, I think it's going to get more complex, not less. So, you know, hold on. Yeah. So you're in you to, to add? You know, the only thing I would say is that because construction was deemed as an essential uh, industry during that time, a lot, a lot of the projects that were in the pipeline were uh, able to be accelerated uh, because people were not working and construction can uh, plow ahead. I think a lot is yet to be revealed on the true impact of, of COVID. And, you know, I think once, you know, we had the PPP, right, uh, and that many companies were able to take advantage of. There was a moratorium on evictions, right, for residential. So, you know, I think 2022 and 2023 is going to be uh, very telling uh, how we come out of the pandemic uh, and, and live in this new world, as Susan said. Uh, you know, the, the other thing that would be interesting to uh, to discover is how healthcare will operate will that operate differently you know we what we're seeing is a lot of restaurants now building more drive-throughs right like chipotle which would never have a drive-through they're doing drive-throughs just in case we get hit with some other pandemic uh and people can grab and go so i think it's really changing the way people do business uh and that will still be um uh something that you know we'll see those trends going forward i believe well, Leslie, with thanks, Terrence, with this, with these constantly changing um, dynamics that we're seeing, especially given the pandemic, and with what Susan and Terrence are saying, is that we may not even see the overall impact until next year, year beyond. How is TCU preparing their future real estate um, investors and developers um, and entrepreneurs to enter uh, this to enter this industry? And um, in a way that allows them to be agile and adaptable to these changing, these changing. So, so we've had the last couple of years at Neely, um, besides just even eliminating what we've had to do because teaching through Zoom, mm-hmm. um, we've had a big initiative with the with the dean with the centers of excellence. Mm-hmm. And so we've got a center for real estate, we've got a sales center, we've got a center for entrepreneurship and innovation. And so what I'm saying is we're able to produce a more well-rounded student because the professors in the classroom, we're teaching them the theory and the concepts and the basics that they need. And of course, I'm lucky enough to get guest speakers to come in like Susan and Terrence to talk to my students about the real world. And so what happens is through development of those centers and the programs that they provide to students, I think they get the foundational knowledge that they need, but then they also get the tools and the skills they need to be able to succeed in the real world. And, um, you know, we're doing all kinds of great things with the centers and I'm really excited about it. One, one interesting little nugget, and I don't know, uh, Terrence, you probably could share the same thing. So when I was at TCU, I started in 2004 and like there was all these, um, you know, there was business and finance and different majors. And then there was supply chain and e-business. And we're like, what's that? Like, <laughs> what do you, why would you do that? That sounds like no one's going to even do that. You just build a website. And I mean, literally guys, I graduated in 2008. I mean, that's how quickly it changes. Mm-hmm. Um, and just, you know, where we're going now, um, you know, we were already like this. We're almost inverted in terms of innovation, growth, um, and uh, it's just it's it's just really interesting. But literally, I mean, we in two thousand and eight, I was like e business. I took like a class. You know, it's just so interesting how it changes so quickly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you bring up something so interesting, Susan, in seeing how something that seems um, 
a, an area of study that can seem innocuous and how it just explodes and grows in a very short period of time. And give, if we parallel that with what we're seeing um, in real estate development and in this industry, the changes and the growth that you all have seen even in your careers, I'd like to uh, I'd like to focus on that a little bit. What are some of the nuggets that you that you provide to our TCU students? What are some things that you share with them that you wish you would have you would have known? more about as you were as you were starting out in your careers yeah i mean i, I would go first um i you know i think the biggest thing was um i had the, i guess i had a misperception of real estate and how real estate could be leveraged right um the, i think the old school way of thinking is how much profit you can get um, and I mean, there are still companies that are focused on that, but um, I've I've grown to really embrace this idea that you can leverage real estate to 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 be more of an impact vehicle too uh, for areas. And uh, I enjoy. I think one of the questions that came up: Do you do you prefer new construction or taking an old building and uh, reimagining that that asset and i have a passion for that just because uh i learn i love this sort of idea of urbanization right and creating this sort of melting pot where people can come together uh the other thing that i wish i would have probably thought about when i was back at tcu is the power of green space like creating these like like the deck park in dallas like totally changed that whole area right and you no, know, you can create these sort of amenities in these communities through parks, through trails uh, that are true connectors, right? Um, and so I think you're gonna start seeing more of that uh, going forward or where people are thinking about more environmental justice and uh, how the uh, clean energy, things like that, that's gonna really revolutionize real estate. Thanks for that. Mine is more anecdotally, um, just um, I underestimated uh, uh, how dynamic and, and, and in the best way possible, how hard this business is. Um, you know, real estate's been around since Jesus. So, and we really didn't have it gone through a disruption in, you know, I mean, there's been, economy movements, but in terms of how we think about like typical real estate, I mean, it was 2000 years, you know, it's just like, what are we doing? So um, that's number one. Number two, now that we really um, are kind of on this fast track in terms of in innovation and constantly changing and really, you know, the markets are so efficient now, um, really realizing how much you almost have to question your thinking every single day. And I don't know that that's going to go away. Um, and so when you think about getting into real estate um, or being an entrepreneur, just, I mean, it is, it, it's, it's, a, it's a lot more dynamic. It's a lot more variable, uh, varied um, than I ever, ever thought it was. And, and, and candidly, when I graduated in 2008, it wasn't like that. But where we sit today, and I think, you know, students that are coming out, I mean, that will be their reality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's um, interesting you say that because we do have a question from uh, Johnny Fobbs Jr. who says that he's been a residential lender for five years, but he's curious to know if you were starting entrepreneurship in the market now, what would be your, what route would you take? Um, would it have still been the same one or what would you even recommend to those who are, who are starting out? Um, I think Susan hit on it uh, with her with her comments is that uh, you have to understand that it's hard. It's hard work. Uh, you have to base that. Uh, you have to base your moving forward as an entrepreneur uh, with a really clear strategy. Right. And then also really understand your why. Why are you wanting to lead uh, your own company and what sort of value proposition you're going to bring to the marketplace that will differentiate you from the other competitors. Uh, I think that's one of the biggest mistakes. Uh, you get into uh, a role or, you know, starting your own company and you don't realize 
how, how competitive the, the landscape is, uh, the amount of capital that it takes, right, to keep it afloat. Uh, I, would, I, would, I would have more money saved and more time allocated because it always takes you twice as long. It costs you twice as much uh, starting out. And so that would be my advice. Uh, I don't know if Susan or Leslie have any comments. No, uh, just just for me, um, you yeah, know, if if I was leaving um, uh, school today and starting entrepreneurship, you know, I would I would question if there's other. This is just for me personally. If there's other areas of the business I'd want to be in, still still around real estate. So whether it be like supply chain, supply chain really is super integrated with real estate. Um, but at the end of the day, that's all my mind knows is real estate. Yeah, you know, we were raised in it. Um, and so I'm probably not, I'm not meant to do anything else. <laughs> so um, I've got one other thing I would say is, at least when I'm teaching students is, you need to love what you do. And it's so important. It's still work, but it's not, it's not what it is for someone who doesn't love what they do. And one of the programs that we've got for students right now is our program for the fall is a series of, of workshops with students that are that's called is the series is called from education to employment. So we're trying to help them figure out what do they like about real estate, what do they not like about it, because sometimes you've got to go through different iterations of what you don't like to figure out where you do want to go. And you know, to the question where, where Johnny's asking from entrepreneurship is if you start out with something that you're really interested in, something that you're passionate about, that flows through in whatever product or whatever service you ultimately have to offer the market. And, you know, I used to think it sounded like Susan said kind of cheesy, but um, I love what I do. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and I think definitely Susan and Terrence do too. And so it's, finding that passion and real estate has something to offer everyone. I mean, whether you want to do something in sales, whether you do want to do something like Susan mentioned with supply chain, um, whether we've got a, a business information systems classes now, Susan. So uh, if you want to get a marketing degree and work for a real estate firm, if you want to get an accounting degree and work for a real estate firm, I mean, there's all, real estate offers almost anything that any of the degrees that you can get in Neely and some of the degrees, like somebody wanted to know about how psychology was helping Terrence in real estate. It's like, it all feeds together mm -hmm. and it's pretty, it's pretty neat. It's pretty neat. So it means we literally do have something for everyone. And I love that. I love how each of you has touched on how important it is to find that passion and pursue it. Uh, we're hearing that so much now across industries, um, even in leadership development programs, et cetera. That is the core message that um, is being delivered to anyone um, as they continue along their entrepreneurship journey or their career journey. It's what are you truly passionate about? How do you leverage that and make it your purpose and pursue it with everything you have? And I believe that you all have given some great personal examples of how, of how you're doing that. Terrence, we do have this question in, from uh, Tracy Sterling Bristol, who asked, who says she would just love to hear how your psychology major serves you well in your real estate work. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, I think it, it keeps me from going crazy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, you know, I think my whole journey at TCU uh, really uh, helped me develop as a, as a person, as a professional, uh, and I think, uh, you know, my major had some to do with that, but I, I'd be candid. I, I think, you know, football had a lot uh, to do with it. I mean, you learn so many lessons. I know Johnny, I see Johnny is on here from 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 playing football. Uh, you know, cultural is totally different. I grew up in a predominantly uh, African-American community. So when I came to TCU, it was a culture shock for me. Right. But then I've learned to better my communication skills. I learned how to interact with people of all different sort of backgrounds and, and walks of, of life. And so all of that prepares you right for this journey uh, that we're all on. I mean, we're all walking our own journey in our careers and our uh, in our past. But I, I, I think that 
the psychology came in, in, in real estate in particular, uh, it helps me negotiate, right? I'm always trying to understand what the other person is thinking and their point of, uh, and their perspective, right? So if you begin with that in mind, typically you can get to an answer and resolve issues more quickly. And so I, I was able to take that from my uh, classes at uh, TCU in psychology. Thanks for uh, thanks for answering that, Terrence, and this idea of being able to understand the other person and or the other parties and what their what their needs are and how and what they're coming to the table for. I'm sure serves you, Susan and Leslie, quite well <laughs> in your um, in in your work. I'd like to I, I'd like to turn to a topic that I know. I think Tracy got frozen. <laughs> Let's see, is there, I don't see any new questions over there. I thought TCU had the best internet in the whole world. There she is. <laughs> Are you ready? Maybe. It's so like I got a campus to do stuff I can't do at home because my internet at home is so bad. There she is. Okay. Um, are we are we okay? Just want to make sure. We're, okay, great. Um, so I'd like to turn um, to this conversation um, specifically around gentrification, because sometimes addressing older parts of town um, is a developer saying tearing the will go in and tear down existing structures. Sometimes with the desire to gentrify the area, um, I'd like to open uh, the discussion. Um, Susan and Terrence, what are you doing to avoid that? And then Leslie, could you add in what would be, what's the benefit of avoiding gentrification, but truly going in and 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 creating moments of revitalization and, and redevelopment of those areas? Yeah, I can I can go first. Um, you know, I don't like the the term uh, gentrification, but it's, mm -hmm. it's it's the reality, right? Uh, I, I prefer more uh, gentle, uh, gentle vocation, right? Where th the reality is at Redbird, we're investing $200 million in a community that has not seen investment in years, right? So there's gonna be some change, right? The, the, the biggest thing that we try to emphasize is how does uh, our project impact the community and where it doesn't push people out, but bring people in, right? And so we try to, uh, one way we do that is fulfilling the, the needs for that particular community, right? And so uh, that has helped us in going a, a long way with uh, not displacing people. The other thing with our, uh, our multifamily project is a class A, luxury apartments but 70 percent of the units are affordable so that is able to keep the uh, uh people that would normally be in that community uh to keep them there uh and so we try to keep our uh the city of dallas was very instrumental in helping us from a, a financial grant standpoint they invested 20 uh, roughly 28 million dollars uh in the project so that enabled us to keep our rents where they're a lot more affordable for the community and so I think if you can tie all those different things together, uh, it doesn't 100% uh, solve the issue of gentrification, but at least keep it where it's attainable for the people of that community. I'm um, I'm fangirling over what Terrence just said. I couldn't I couldn't have said it any better. Seriously, I mean, and he's a that project is a perfect example of how it can be done well. And, and while still acknowledging, like, I love how he acknowledged, I mean, there's going to be change, um, but doing it in the, doing it in the right way and keeping people, you know, bringing more people in as opposed to displacing. I mean, just that, just that shift um, is a, a lot of developers don't get that. So I, I feel like Terrence must've led the, breakfast meeting that the Urban Land Institute had yesterday morning here in Fort Worth. <laughs> and that was the first time I had heard the term gentrification. <laughs> and the first time I heard it, I thought, what did I hear? 
And then the lady said it again. And it was like, and it was the whole process, like what you're talking about. Gentrification shoves people out that have been in a neighborhood or have been in a community for decades. And so there's a lot of problems with that. So I, I like I like that new term too, or it's a new term to me. Um, and then the, the other thing that they mentioned at this meeting, I took a took a group of 12 students to this meeting and you know we all learned different things from it is what I gathered when we finished. Mm -hmm. But it was neat to hear there were people from the city of Fort Worth who spoke, um, our new mayor spoke, and she said that what her mindset when she goes into meetings and she meets with developers and she meets with the community about projects is she wants to get to yes and she's got this attitude of let's make things work as opposed to having the attitude that some people have is it's a lot easier to say no it's a lot easier to not you know we're taking on big problems and so what terrence has done at redbird you know, what other developers have done in underserved communities, those are hard jobs. And so she said, we want to get to yes. And I thought, I am so happy to hear somebody say that, especially in a position like your mayor is in. So Terrence, come set your sights on Fort Worth and see what you can do over here for us too. Yeah, I love to do something in Fort Worth. We would love for you to. You know, the, the only, the, the one other thing I would add too is, um, and I'm just learning this, but um, we're also trying to fight decisions that were made back in the 60s and the 70s, right? Right. There were interstates, you know, that were planned through predominantly African-American communities. And these interstates were a true divide. And so uh, Dallas and Fort Worth, you know, both both cities have can do a better job with sort of race relations and how we can just be one city, right? And it's, it's combating some of those decisions that were made well before, you know, I was even alive. But, you know, I think what we're seeing now is a city starting to think through how we can pull these communities back together through public green space, like these dynamic parks and things like that, where you're starting to see true investments in those areas. So interesting you say that, Terrence, and understanding what those decisions have were um, historically and how you have to how you have to overcome those and combat those in the decisions that you all make for um, for your development. It brings up another aspect of this, and I'd like to um, get everyone's point of view. Susan and Terrence, you both are considered local developers like you know you know the cities of Fort Worth and Dallas and you know historical context what would you all say are some of the pros and cons of local developers versus uh, non-local or outside developers coming in and um, and taking on these projects um, I'll go first um, I think two things you know, there's pros and cons there truly is so yeah I I truly believe you can't dream what you haven't seen. And so having um, outside perspectives that someone else has been in another community and seen something amazing done there that we haven't seen here, um, I encourage it. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm excited, more, more opportunity, more things for our community to see that we haven't seen. Um, so i.e. welcoming of um, out of state, out of town developers. Um, but that being said that, you know, the con or the potential shadow side of that is just um, obviously if someone lives in the community, they just their stake in it is different. It just is. And that's human nature. So I think you get um, positive and negatives of both. I'm always. I'm a big, I'm a big proponent of travel. I'm a big proponent of seeing other cultures, other ways of people, other ways of doing things. And if I have to, if I've got to pick between the two, I'm always going to pick being exposed to more instead of less. I think, I think Susan, you're right on the, uh, the other thing, what we've done, uh, we're, we're pretty close on the mall redevelopment in Houston. We identify community partners. Uh, that have been in that area for a long time and they advise us on what sort of community organizations we should be meeting with what are some of the concerns the community has I think having that sort of alignment if you're going to come in from out of state is uh, critical I mean I look at Redbird 
uh, my uh, partner on the development is Peter Brodsky, and he's originally from New York, right? Uh, and this is his first real estate transaction. So he relied heavily on feedback from the community and my experience that, uh, with development uh, in those areas to, to lean on. And so I think if you have that sort of approach, it can, it can work out very successfully. Thanks for that, Wesley. I don't have anything to add to that one. <laughs> Thanks so much. It's in, so thank you all for sharing that perspective because I think sometimes in this conversation around um, redevelopment, revitalization, and even I love that term gentrification that you um, have introduced uh, us to today, Terrence. This there it can seem to be an either or conversation instead of a both and. And you all have been able to point out how necessary it is to approach it as a both and conversation to really ensure that uh, the communities in which you're serving are truly getting the at the best benefit possible um, from both local development and knowledge and historical context, as well as understanding of what else is out there that can be brought into the local community for, for its benefit. So thank you for pointing that out. We have about seven minutes left. So I want to remind the audience, if you have any additional questions, please uh, let us know what those are. But we did have one come through that I think is, if we have to end on this question, that I think is a great one for us to end on. What do you all personally love about the spirit of Dallas-Fort Worth that you are working to highlight in your, um, in your careers? I think, um, and, and you had said, uh, Mayor Maddie Parker said this, but, um, and we can always, we can always do better at it, um, always do better. But as compared to uh, other places, like we really are kind of a yes area, like let's figure it out. You wanna come here, let's come here, let's do business, let's talk. Um, we're super welcoming and inviting. Um, and that's for, you know, new people, new concepts, new businesses. Um, and, you know, for Fort Worth specifically, you know, probably the, I'd say probably the, the thing that I find most unique for a city of its size, just because it grew so fast, um, is just um, the, um, the commitment at a very strong level for philanthropy within Fort Worth. I mean, Terrence, I you know, you haven't done anything in Fort Worth yet, but it's really interesting, Leslie, I don't know if you can share this, but like philanthropy is very much a part of Fort Worth's culture. Um, it's, it's very rare for someone to not be involved in some type of um, cause or committee. Um, and I don't know how that happened um, to be so ingrained in the culture, but that is pretty unique. There's some very generous people in Fort Worth, not, not just generous of their money, but their time and their resources. And it's special, it's special. Yeah, you know, the thing that I would highlight uh, is I think DFW is, is well positioned for the next several years for growth. I mean, the amount of people that are, are moving uh, to this Metroplex is, uh, is astounding, candidly. So uh, I think what makes it, uh, our, our city's unique is they're so culturally diverse, right? And I think if you can uh, come up ways where like in Dallas, you have the arts districts, you have the design district, there's something for everyone to kind of get plugged into. Uh, and I think you need to continue to do that to make both Dallas and Fort Worth more uh, vibrant uh, and a, a real option for young professionals to want to live and come and live and work in. I heard a stat the other day that said um, a 737 lands every day in DFW and the people get off and they never leave. Every day. Wow. Well, I mean, I know that that's what's contributed to Fort Worth being, <laughs> being named by the Census Bureau um, as one of the top five cities with the largest population increase. So that is, that is an amazing statistic <laughs> that, yes. but it also shows uh, just how fast growing the Metroplex is and what that could possibly mean for other um, for other development and other real estate trends to be seen in um, in Dallas Fort Worth. So um, thank you all for for sharing what you what you're highlighting. Um, I'd like to just add 
one more um, addendum to that question. And what do you, what would you hope to see um, in, in DFW in regards to any additional trends or what movement we should see in, um, in the real estate industry? Uh, I can go first on that. I think I, I hit on this a little bit earlier, but, um, you know, I, I, my hope is that every community uh, in Dallas Fort Worth uh, will have access to the necessities, whether it's a grocery store, quality housing, health care. That's the dream, right? Uh, if, if we can figure that out, where regardless of how much income you have, uh, you still can enjoy a, a good quality of life because you have those sort of amenities and proximity to you. Uh, and I think that's that's the goal. That's that's what I hope to see uh, over time. Terrence, that was our, that was the, one of the main discussion points yesterday morning at that ULI meeting was wow. you know, parts of the seriously. It's like, are you sure you weren't there? <laughs> <laughs> but it, they were talking about the parts of Fort Worth, the underserved communities that need grocery stores. And, you know, they mentioned that, you know, so many people want an HEB and I'm sitting there thinking there are people in Fort Worth that would say, we just want a grocery store right. I'm not going to be right. and say i want the gold standard of an hub -E mm -hmm. i just want to have a grocery store in my community and so i think working towards that goal and the people in the city of fort worth were really embracing that and i'm looking forward to, i'm looking forward to see where we go under a new leadership mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um yeah I, I i couldn't echo more what um terrence and leslie both said i'd say the only other thing is just um because we are growing so quickly, just um, in an ideal world, we'd really focus on how we can grow smart. And uh, one, not only with you know how we're developing and what we're developing and who we're attracting, but two, um, trying to be mindful of um, inclusivity while also maintaining just just the the culture that makes it so special today. Which it's just such a balance. Um, but that's all I can add. Well, thank you all so much. This has definitely been an incredible hour. I want to thank Leslie, Terrence, and Susan for sharing with us your thoughts and your experience. I'd also like to thank TCU Magazine and the TCU Alumni Association for their collaboration and bringing this panel of experts together. And lastly, thank you to the audience for listening and asking your thought-provoking questions. Uh, thank you for joining us for this hour. If you'd like to keep up to date on the happenings at TCU and among the Frog family, please go to magazine.tcu.edu. And lastly, if you want to listen again or share today's event, as well as numerous other in fantastic interviews with TCU alumni and TCU Magazine features, please subscribe to our podcast. You can do so by searching TCU alumni on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, or SoundCloud. Thank you everyone for joining us during this lunch hour, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.